It is good to be together again tonight to study from the book of Acts. As I said last week, uh, hopefully I am not in Madison right now. That, that is my hope and my prayer. I am recording this ahead of time, anticipating a trip to Denver, followed by, I guess I would say, the scenic route home from Denver via Port Angeles, Washington, to see my sister. That is, if the Lord wills. I know that a lot can go wrong on a trip like this. But as I have heard before, when things go wrong, that is when the adventure begins. And so I'm hoping to have uh, some adventure over the next couple weeks. And not too much adventure, but enough adventure to be a little bit exciting. So th those are my plans, and hopefully I'll be back with you soon. But for those of you in the Madison area, I hope you can all come together for worship this coming Sunday, either at 9 or 11. I hope you can be present for the class at 10. And for our members, please use the Sign Up Genius account to sign up for one of the two services. And remember, guests are always welcome at either service. Uh, tonight, we are continuing our study of the book of Acts, the book of gospel action written by Luke, the beloved physician, to a man by the name of Theophilus, kind of giving him a history of the early church, focusing on the ministry of Peter and then of Paul. And up to this point in the book, we've looked at the first 16 chapters. We're partway through chapter 17. In the ABCs of Acts, we have Ascension, Beginning of the Church, Carried and cured, determined disciples, empty jail, first deacons with the question mark, great hero, how can I? I am Jesus, journey to Joppa, kingdom now includes Gentiles, liberated again, missionary sent out, not gods but men, old law not binding, Philippian jailer converted. And then last week we started Acts 17 with Paul preaching in Thessalonica and then in Berea. And tonight we move to the second half of Acts 17 where the summary is questions answered in Athens. And by way of review, this is where we are in the map. This is Paul's second missionary journey. So this kind of gives us the big picture here. And then I've zoomed in again on the western loop of this journey from Philippi down to Thessalonica, then to Berea, and now down to Athens. You may remember from the very end of last week's class how Paul is run out of Berea and the brethren uh, escort him all the way to Athens. So he leaves uh, Timothy and Silas behind, and when he gets to Athens, he gives that command through his escorts that Silas and Timothy are to join him down there in Athens as soon as possible. So the way I see it, Paul comes into this huge city. He's almost overwhelmed by the potential. He's overwhelmed by what he sees. This is great. This is awesome. A lot of potential here, but I absolutely need some help. And so he sends for help as soon as he arrives. And that brings us to Acts 17, verses 16 through 21. That'll be our first paragraph tonight. Acts 17, verses 16 through 21. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing the city full of idols. So he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be present. And also, some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers were conversing with him. Some were saying, what would this idle babbler wish to say? Others, he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities, because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is which you are proclaiming? For you are bringing some strange things to our ears, so we want to know what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. Up in verse 16, as Paul is waiting for Silas and Timothy to get there in Athens, it's almost as if he's doing some sightseeing. It's not hardcore, but he's, he's looking around a little bit. He obviously notices what's in the town, and as he gets to know the city of Athens, he notices that the city is absolutely full of idols. Uh, one commentary suggested that the idols outnumbered people in Athens. <laughs> one ancient uh, commentary said it was like a two or three to one ratio. It's just so many idols. Every street corner, every little nook and cranny, there was some kind of statue or idol. So idols were absolutely everywhere. And Luke says that Paul's spirit was being provoked within him. So seeing this gets Paul agitated. It makes him uncomfortable. He knows this is not right. And obviously for Paul, as a devout Jew, this is pretty much the first two commandments, right? In the Ten Commandments, no other gods before me, no graven images. Right there, the first two are just blown away in Athens. These are not uh, Jewish people by any means, uh, for the most part. So he knows that uh, these people really need to hear about the one true God. So that's why he's there. His spirit is agitated. He's really irritated by this. 
And so as his custom has been, notice he goes to the synagogue. Uh, also notice he does not use his lack of backup and support as an excuse not to get started. Paul cannot stay quiet, can he? He doesn't wait for Luke. He doesn't wait for Timothy. But he goes right to the synagogue and he reasons with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles. At the same time, though, notice he also reasons in the marketplace with anybody who happened to be present. So these were not... Uh, like-minded people. He just goes out there in the community. Uh, Paul loves interacting with people. He wasn't somebody who sat in an office all day, but Paul got out there among the people, and he did it often. As he discusses the Christian faith with the crowds, some Epicurean and Stoic philosophers, they join in on the conversation, and they're pretty condescending, aren't they? What would this idle babbler wish to say? As I remember it, idle babbler uh, kind of roughly refers to seed picker, a seed picker, <laughs> kind of the idea of a bird going around and kind of pecking seeds off the ground here and there. And it might have been the idea, the accusation that Paul wasn't a deep thinker, that he just went around and combined a bunch of thoughts from everybody else. So it was almost a way of accusing him of plagiarism. So we have these highly educated Epicurean, Stoic philosophers, and they're kind of, ooh, look at this seed picker. He's just kind of out there taking stuff from all different philosophies, and and he's just there talking nonsense. Uh, others were saying he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities. So they saw Jesus and the resurrection as being rather strange, and they are absolutely right, aren't they? Jesus is unusual. Jesus is the one and only. There is no other. So as Paul continues, the philosophers they take him to the Areopagus. Uh, some of the older translations may refer to this as Mars Hill. Mars was the Roman god, but the name Areopagus reflects kind of the Greek side of it. Uh, so we're in Greece at this point, so the Areopagus is more accurate. If they were in Rome, it would have been called Mars Hill if they had something like that there. Uh, but here in Greece, this is the Areopagus. Uh, some of the older translations were supported kind of more by Latin than they were by the original Greek, and so some of them kind of still hang on to Mars Hill. It's not wrong, wrong, it's the same place, uh, but it's a, a little bit more accurate to use the Greek name since we are actually in Athens, Greece. Uh, someday I would love to make it to the Areopagus. I don't know if that'll ever happen, uh, but maybe someday. One of these days, if one of you goes to Greece, it just, uh, just buy an extra ticket, and I would love to kind of get in there and just go along with you a little bit. Uh, to give us some idea of where Paul is being taken, I'm uh, putting a picture on the screen here. The Areopagus is the rock outcropping in the lower left-hand corner of the picture. Philosophers would get together on this rock outcropping to discuss the meaning of life or you know, anything like that. Those deep issues, they would come together to uh, discuss and argue and debate things. Uh, my grandfather preached for 12 or 13 years down in Lynchburg, Tennessee. And whenever we would go there, we would walk from his house down to the city square. If you've ever been to Lynchburg, Tennessee, you know there's like a courthouse or something right there on the square. And outside the courthouse, there were all the old guys, and they were sitting there whittling. They all had their pocket knives and their sticks, and, and these old guys were solving the world's problems, sitting there... <laughs> doing whatever old guys do. And it's kind of the picture I get here, only maybe kind of the next level. These were highly educated men, and they would come to this place to hang out and to argue and debate. So they bring Paul into that. Well, uh, this relatively small outcropping, the Areopagus, the little rock place there on the lower left, we've got a little photo op going on here. Um, it, it is out in front of a much larger rock outcropping known as the Acropolis. And this one is in the upper right on the screen here. The Acropolis, of course, is where the Parthenon once stood. The Parthenon being the temple to Athena, the patron goddess of Athens. Athens, Athena. Athena, Athens. So uh, her temple was up on the top of that Acropolis looking down over the Areopagus. And so if we can picture this, Paul is taken to the Areopagus and he is given the opportunity to preach the gospel. He is surrounded by idols in a city full of idols and he's pretty much standing in the shadow of the Acropolis, home of the Parthenon, the temple of Athena. If you ever make it to Nashville, Tennessee, I would 
highly recommend stopping in for a tour of a full-size replica of the Parthenon. It was built in the late 1800s for um, some kind of huge exhibition down in Nashville. It wasn't the World's Fair, but it was something like that. I, I didn't look up that detail, but uh, this building is absolutely huge. You can actually go inside. They have a huge statue of Athena there inside this uh, Parthenon, this reconstruction. And I don't know whether you can see this on your screen, your device, whatever you're using tonight, but there is a man standing at Athena's feet. And the times that I've been there, I didn't realize that you could actually get up on that platform. Maybe you're not supposed to. Maybe this guy kind of jumped up there when the security guard wasn't looking. Maybe he's breaking the rules here. But when I was standing on the main floor at the base of that platform, the top of that platform where she is standing is about as high as my head. And so if I just walk up to the statue, I can just barely see Athena's toes right there. That's how big it is. It is a massive statue, and it is rather impressive. And I remember thinking that I could almost understand how somebody could worship something like that, especially if there were sacrifices being offered, and fire, and smoke, and people dressed up, and blood everywhere, and all of that. I mean, it was... It was impressive. So this is a full-size replica. And again, if you ever go through Nashville, Tennessee, I would strongly encourage you to stop in there and take a look at it. It'll give you a much deeper appreciation for the book of Acts and Paul and, and what he did there. But Paul was speaking on a rock outcropping kind of down at the base of the Acropolis where the original Parthenon was located. Well, back in our text, the philosophers want to know May we know what this new teaching is which you are proclaiming? And that that is an awesome, open-ended question. It is a wise question. You can tell a lot about somebody's kind of wisdom level, I think, by the questions that they ask. Instead of asking a specific question, instead of asking questions that can only be answered with a yes or a no, uh, these men, I think, wisely open it up. Basically, tell us what you believe. And so they turn it over to the Apostle Paul and they explain, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears. So we want to know what these things mean. And I know there's quite a bit of potential in that question also. However, uh, Luke also points out that the philosophers of Athens and the visitors used to spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. Very interesting. They weren't necessarily interested in the truth, were they? But they wanted to hear something new. And there is a difference between wanting the truth and wanting something new. Obviously, there's a huge difference. And that reminds me of something one of my college professors said many years ago. He said, the goal of preaching is to be as unoriginal as possible. And at first I thought, wait a minute, that can't be right. I'm going into preaching. I want to be original. I want people to think that I'm a, I'm an original thinker. And uh, I remember thinking that can't be right. And yet, as I thought about that a little bit more, um, I suddenly realized some preachers get in trouble, don't they? When they always try to come up with some new thing that nobody's ever heard before. That's not our mission as preachers. Uh, that's not the goal of preaching. We are preaching a very, very old message. And our goal really is to go back and to get that message as close to the original as possible. So we're not trying to preach something new, but we're actually trying to preach something very, very old. Not that we need to be boring, uh, not that we can never use a new method, not that we can never discover something new in the Bible that we've never noticed before. Uh, that's great if that happens. Uh, but our goal is to go back to the old, old story as we sometimes sing. The philosophers in Athens, though, they, on the other hand, uh, they were always looking to hear something new. That was exciting to them. Uh, by the way, this lesson is making me a bit hungry. I don't know if I should admit that or not. Uh, have any of you ever been to Athens Euros on the far northwest side of Lake Mendota? We need to take a field trip to Athens Euros. Not only are the Euros excellent, but they have some of the best fries in the Madison area. So I don't know, I should look uh, look to them for a sponsorship or something. But uh, Athens Euros, I got to go up there, but I kind of think of Athens Euros whenever we uh, look at Acts chapter 17. Anyway, this sets us up for what comes next. So let's continue then tonight with Acts 17, 22 and 23. Acts 17, 22 and 23. And at first, 
I had Paul's entire speech on one screen, <laughs> but it was too much. I know some of you are looking at this on cell phones, and the print got a little bit too small. But what he says here in this sermon, it's almost one ginormous run-on sentence, and I struggled <laughs> with where to divide it into screen-sized chunks. It's almost like he's speaking in a way so as not to allow people to interrupt. He just, It's just one he just speaks and he doesn't stop and so it's kind of hard to split this up but I've done the best that I can so let's start with the first two verses Acts 17 22 and 23 so Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said men of Athens I observe that you are very religious in all respects for while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship I also found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. What I hope we notice here is that Paul seems to start with something that comes surprisingly close to a compliment. I'm not saying it was a compliment, but it is surprisingly close to a compliment. He doesn't rail on these people for being low-down, evil, good-for-nothing, pagan idol worshipers. That's not his approach here. But he takes what he notices, and he starts with this observation. So this is what I have seen. I observe that you are very religious in all respects. So notice they're very carefully, very diplomatically worded. He doesn't endorse their religion, but he acknowledges it. I see that you are religious. So this is at least somewhere to start. Uh, years ago, I took a master's class on cross-cultural communication down at UW-Whitewater, and one thing I remember from that class is the observation that when two people who are strangers meet each other for the very first time, it's almost a, a universal practice that these two strangers getting to know each other will immediately start looking for similarities. And so two people walk up to each other. Hi, I'm Baxter. I'm from Wisconsin. And the other person might say, oh, well, I'm from Colorado. And then I would naturally reply, oh, I had a great-grandfather who worked at a silver mine in Colorado, and the other guy would say, well, I drive a Harley-Davidson, and, and you see how that works. So similarities are being established. As human beings, the natural tendency when we meet a stranger is to start looking for things that we have in common. And if you just observe strangers meeting, you'll notice that that is almost always the truth. And that seems to be what Paul is doing here. He makes this observation oh, I see that you're religious. I'm also religious. Now, tell, let me tell you about it. So kind of that's going to be the structure of his sermon. That seems to be what he's doing here. He makes an observation, and then he starts there, and he moves into what he needs to communicate. So they're religious. They have many idols in the city. And then Paul talks about how he saw this one statue that was dedicated to an unknown God. He starts here. And then he gets ready to introduce them to the one true and living God, the one God that they missed. As I understand it, the Greeks were so superstitious that even though they had so many idols, they were still worried that they might have missed somebody. And so they apparently put this idol out there just in case. This was the catch-all idol. The, you know, gods, don't be offended. If, if we didn't put one up for you, this is yours. And Paul uses this to try to teach them about the God that they do not yet know. Well, let's continue with Acts 17, verses 24 through 28. Acts 17, 24 through 28, Paul has given them a compliment of some kind. I see you are religious. And now he's ready to introduce them to the God that they do not yet know. Acts 17, 24 through 28. The God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist. As even some of your own poets have said, for we also are his children. So now Paul makes a contrast, doesn't he? On one hand, we look all around us and we see gods, little g gods who dwell in temples. But let me tell you about the God who made the world 
and absolutely everything we see around us. Since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, he does not dwell in temples made with hands. So I think we need to remember where Paul is standing. He is standing on the Areopagus. He could very easily gesture to the Parthenon or to any number of temples. My God doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. And unlike these gods, the God who created the heavens and everything we see around us doesn't need a building like that to contain him. He doesn't need a place to live like this. In the same way, neither is he served by human hands. The pagan priest, of course, would serve the gods by offering sacrifices. The gods would need to be dusted off from time to time, kind of get the cobwebs out of their armpits, and they need to be polished and maybe uh, repaired or moved around from time to time. God, though, is different. He doesn't need anything. He doesn't need to be fixed. Instead, the opposite of true is true. Not only does he not need anything, but he provides for our needs. He gives to all people life and breath and all things. In verse 26, or in verse, yeah, in verse 26, to me, Paul seems to be connecting this with his audience very personally again. We are in this together. Notice the thought here. God made not just the Jews. You know, Genesis isn't just a Jewish story. Uh, God made all of us, and therefore we are all one. We are men from every nation, and on top of that, God put us where we are. So I'm from over there, you're from over here. But that's okay. God put us where we are. God put us where we belong for this moment. And God's purpose in placing us where we are is to make it so that we can find him. Unlike the Greek and Roman gods, the God of creation is accessible. I think that's how I would summarize that little uh, section right there. Uh, he is not far from us. He wants us to go looking for him. I don't have to travel a thousand miles to a temple somewhere to find him, but he's everywhere. Uh, in him we live and survive, as we sometimes sing. Uh, the good A.W. Dykus song, 728b, is kind of all about this. Uh, then in verse 28, Paul even quotes one of their own poets. Even these people recognize, for we also are his children. So even pagan idol worshipers in some way understand that we are God's children. I know sometimes people wonder whether it's okay for preachers to occasionally quote secular sources, uh, obviously, our lessons need to be based on the Word of God. That is our focus. But it is absolutely acceptable to quote uninspired sources if those sources help communicate God's truth. And what I notice here is that in this lesson, not once does Paul actually quote from Scripture itself. He doesn't say, according to this verse over here in Daniel, uh, you people need to believe that. He never does that. And I think the reason is, these people don't care about Scripture. Uh, if he had said, you need to believe in God because Genesis 1-1 teaches that there is a God, these people would not have cared about that. They didn't respect the authority of Scripture at this point. And so, uh, for that reason, I believe Paul quotes one of their own poets. So let's continue on then with Acts 17, 29 through 31. Acts 17, 29 through 31. Being then the children of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of man. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent, because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. In verse 29, Paul makes this very personal. He's making a contrast on one hand. Uh, since we are the children of God, we have these uh, gods over here made out of silver and gold, but our God is not like that. We are God's children. So we have silver and gold. We can imagine Paul again pointing up the hill to Athena. And on the other hand, we have God who is our father. Uh, he was not formed by the art and thought of man. He wasn't created by artisans like that statue up there on the hill and so he is making a logical contrast between their gods and the one true and living god and to me it's, a, it's just amazing how such highly educated philosophers can believe in gods that they themselves have made and there are a number of passages throughout jeremiah and isaiah just pointing out the absolute ridiculousness of cutting down a tree chopping it in half using one half to make an idol and the other half you burn in the fire and that first half you bow down to as a god. That makes no sense. It is the most incredibly ignorant thing to do. Uh, Paul, though, is patient here. Notice 
He is not insulting. Uh, he doesn't say, how can you people be so stupid? That, that, that's where uh, some of us would be tempted to say something like that. But instead, he's making this logical contrast between God and their gods. And there is a difference. In verse 30, uh, Paul is being as nice as possible. In a, way, in a way, he's calling them ignorant, isn't he? But it doesn't come across that way. It's kind of a kind of backdoor way of, of getting that in there. Uh, in the past, God overlooked the times of ignorance. So it hasn't been a problem up until now kind of thing. The reference here seems to be to Gentiles who were outside the law of Moses. Uh, the law of Moses, of course, was only for the Jews. Given in the mid-1400s BC, nobody else in the whole world had to follow the Ten Commandments, either before Moses or during the time of Moses, if they were not Jews. It was given to them only. So if you were not subject to the law of Moses, then you follow the law of the heart. Paul would go on to describe this in Romans 2. As I understand it, you just did the best that you could. You tried to be good. You did the best you could not to murder your neighbor. And if you succeeded in not murdering your neighbor and not killing your friends and family, well, God would judge you based on what you did with the limited information you had. I'm just totally summarizing there, but I think that's pretty much the gist of it. You followed your conscience and you did what you thought was right. And in those cases, for a vast majority of humanity, uh, Paul says here that God overlooked the times of ignorance. God was very, very tolerant in Old Testament times. God gave humanity the benefit of the doubt. Uh, I think the uh, KJV might say that God winked at the times of ignorance. Of course, today we think wink, and we think kind of mischievousness or something. That's not, that's not it, that God is closing his eyes to the ignorance uh, back then. He overlooked it. He tolerated it. He endured it. Uh, however, Paul says, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent. And this is significant. Some people seem to think that God will overlook times of ignorance today, don't they? Well, as long as somebody didn't know what they were doing, then it's okay. Some people make that argument. But that is clearly not the case. That, that is the opposite of the truth. Today, we will be judged by God with no regard for whether we knew the law of God or not. And that's why we tell people. That's why it's so important that we get the word of God out there. Uh, think of it this way. If God saves those who have never heard the gospel, if he saves people who are totally ignorant, but he condemns those who hear it but reject it, what have we done if we tell somebody about Jesus and they reject it? Haven't we just condemned them? The good news has become bad news. And so then our goal should be, to keep the world as ignorant as possible, if that's the truth, if people are saved in their ignorance, obviously that's not the case. And so we need to understand, based on this verse, that all people who sin are lost, even if they don't know they're sinning, even if they don't know mm -hmm. that they're lost, if they're old enough mm -hmm. to be accountable. Mm -hmm. uh, they're saved by hearing and obeying the gospel. So therefore, we really need to get the gospel out there. And that's what I think Paul is doing in Athens. He's introducing these people to God and certainly he's telling them what they need to do. Uh, just a side note on the use of the word man and men in this verse. Uh, some translations might refer to God commanding all men to repent. The word Paul uses does not refer to males as opposed to females, but the word here that he uses refers to people, uh, mankind in general. It is the basis of our English word anthropology. An anthropologist is not a student of males versus females. An anthropologist is a student of mankind, the study of people. So I just want to be clear here so as not to leave out half the human race <laughs> if we don't need to. Uh, both males and females are called upon to repent. It, it's not just men who are sinners, although it may seem like that sometimes. Uh, thankfully, some of the modern translations are more gender accurate. And as the English language continues to evolve, I think we're getting more clarity here. The New American Standard makes some progress here, and it gets almost halfway to the most accurate way of saying this. God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent. So you see, it's got the men and the people. It needs to be people, people, because that's what's going on here. The ESV is a, a little bit better, even. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Do you see how that's better? Uh, we don't want the Bible to be gender neutral. We want the Bible to be gender accurate. We want those words translated absolutely as accurately as possible. And so all people need to repent, not just the males, in case anybody was in doubt on that. 
Uh, in verse 31, Paul gets to the day of judgment. There's a time coming when God will judge the world through a man. And the proof of this is that he raised this man from the dead. So Paul takes this sermon from their local idols to the resurrection of Jesus. And remember, the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord. And we have all three right here, don't we? We have a dead man who is raised. And to be raised up, you have to be down, that is, buried. So we have the death, we have the burial, and we have the resurrection of Jesus referred to in this passage. Well, let's continue with their action, what they do about this. So we're continuing with Acts 17, verses 32 through 34. Acts 17, 32 through 34. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer. But others said, we shall hear you again concerning this. So Paul went out of their midst. But some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them. Well, it looks like then that mentioning the resurrection pretty much ended Paul's sermon, didn't it? And to me, it's interesting that these highly educated men are able to believe in an idol, but they have a hard time with the resurrection. They begin to sneer. That word refers to mocking. They were making fun of Paul over this, kind of laughing. I can't believe this guy believes somebody can come back from the dead. Um, others, though, were kind of curious, and they wanted to know more. They wanted to hear more about it. Not now, but someday. Uh, remember, earlier we learned that the philosophers were interested in always hearing something new. And so, ooh, this is new. Uh, dead guy comes back. I've never heard that one before over here in Athens. So Paul then leaves the Areopagus. Uh, some men join him and believe. In this case, by the way, the word men actually refers to males. Uh, some men believe. Dionysius the Areop uh, Areopagite is included here. He seems to be kind of one of them. He's one of the philosophers. Uh, as well as a woman named Damaris with a number of others. So we have an actual reference uh, specifically to a woman here. And this is in keeping with Luke's tradition of making a point to include women. He didn't have to do this. He could have said, oh, a few people believe, but he made a point. There were some men and there was this woman. Uh, and this is about it in the city of Athens. It seems accurate to say that this visit was not a, wasn't a huge success in terms of numbers. It's not uh, many people being baptized as in some of the other cities, but some do believe. And I, I kind of think it's interesting to me that we have no books of First and Second Athens. We don't have Paul's letter to Athens later on kind of like we do with First and Second Corinthians and First and Second Thessalonians and so on. Uh, the church doesn't really seem to thrive in Athens. And there's a possibility that they're too educated for Christianity. It's kind of hard not to make a comparison to Madison, where it's been said that we have the highest percentage of PhD cab drivers. You know, here in Madison, we also, as a, as a society, as a culture, we love to hear new things. Uh, but what we really need to hear is a message that is very, very old. And for some, there is simply no appeal in that. The gospel is too simple for some people, especially among those who are highly educated. And I'm not cutting on education at all. I appreciate my uh, brothers and sisters with uh, advanced degrees. Study is awesome. It's good to get, get certified in a number of areas there. Paul was highly educated. Uh, later in 1 Corinthians 1, though, he says that the Greeks search for wisdom, but the gospel is to the Gentiles foolishness. It is beneath them. It is too simple sometimes. And he observes that in the church, there are not many wise according to the flesh. There aren't many PhD types in the Lord's church. And it's not good or bad. It's just an observation. That's, that's just the way it is. Obviously, we want all people to obey the gospel. Uh, this brings us to the end of Acts 17. Next week, we finally get to Corinth. Uh, tonight, though, we've seen questions answered in Athens. The philosophers wanted to know more about the Christian faith, and Paul answers their questions, doesn't he? He gives them an explanation. Uh, thank you for taking the time to study together tonight. I hope you can all be present for worship this Sunday, either at 9 or 11, and please plan on joining us between uh, worship for uh, that Bible class at 10. And please let me know if you have something that we need to be praying about. But let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the great I Am, creator of heaven and earth and creator of all people. You have been so patient in the past and even today in so many ways, but we know that you are looking for repentance. You are looking for changed hearts. We also know that there is a day of judgment coming where your Son will judge the world in righteousness. We therefore pray for your help as we prepare for that day to come. 
Thank you for Paul and now and for how you prepared him so perfectly to preach your word in the city of Athens with his advanced education. We realize that you have also prepared us to do your work, and so we pray that we would take advantage of every opportunity to tell others about you and your kingdom. Thank you, Father, for saving us, and thank you for making us a part of your plan to go into all the world with the good news. In Jesus we pray. Amen.